Ready? Okay. Hi, everybody. I, I think that we solved the glitch here. I, uh, I don't think that the image is going live just yet, uh, but, but it will go soon. So um, thank you very much for being here. I um, hope that you are being uh, uh, socially isolated. I think that I hope that you are safe and I hope that you're doing uh, the right everything and being having these slow times to, to share your your uh, beloved others and take care of yourself. Um, my name is Juan Acuña and I am an associate professor uh, of um, the, at the College of Medicine, Khalifa University. I am an obstetrician and gynecologist and geneticist by training and I have been an epidemiologist for the far last uh, 25 years. I have, um, I, I worked at the Centers for Disease Control for about 11 years and there's where I got in contact with this type of public health and uh, uh, situations and, and, uh, and global or local emergencies caused by uh, the uh, sudden operation of, of something that you cannot control now uh, that has become a global situation with this pandemic. So uh, during the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to try to just uh, present to you and clarify some of the aspects that have been um, discussed and that we know now about the pandemic, um, the, the virus itself uh, called the SARS-CoV-2 and uh, the disease that is producing, that is the COVID-19. Um, as, as you will know, uh, these um, viral uh, pandemics uh, have a, an unfortunate circumstance and is that uh, they are produced by viruses which are 
very uh, small particles. Um, some people deem them not alive. Uh, however, they do have the property that when they find the proper cells uh, in, in human beings or in live animals, they just bind to some of the proteins and they do so because they by themselves have no capacity to reproduce or produce the proteins that they need themselves to just exist. So the controversies on whether they are alive or not uh, are just uh, irrelevant because what they do is that they have the capacity to interact with human beings and with live organisms and use their cells to replicate and to replicate they need two things. First, they need um, their nucleic acids. There are viruses that are DNA viruses and there are viruses that are RNA viruses. This is of the second type. And what they need is a cell that provides the motors and the uh, gas to produce that replication. So they need to replicate the, their nucleic acid Without their nucleic acid, they cannot produce the proteins that they need to exist. And the other thing that they need to is uh, that they need to, for the cell, to produce the proteins for them and then assemble the new particles. So basically these particles, uh, when they uh, get into a cell and they use the cell for the purpose of replication or replicating themselves, they usually kill the cell or damage the cell extensively or make the cell do things that in normal conditions they would not do. Uh, coronavirus is part of a, a family of viruses um, and uh, we know nasty diseases such as SARS and MERS uh, that existed before and that uh, they, um, they are uh, diseases that kill a lot of the people that they infect. From the perspective of, of how the virus behaves, uh, this is a respiratory virus. And respiratory virus has the characteristic that they are uh, very comfortable uh, and they find those receptors in cells in the respiratory system. And as opposed to the regular influenza and uh, common cold viruses, which uh, typically infect the upper respiratory tract, these uh, viruses uh, do infect the uh, very, very low part of the respiratory, uh, respiratory tract, uh, the alveoli. So this has been one of the main uh, differences between these viruses and other viruses, and is that the disease that they produce is produced at the level of one of the most important cells in the lungs that is called the pneumocyte type 2 or type 2 pneumocyte, uh, which produces a very important substance, the surfactant, which is the ones that allow us to breathe air in close contact with the blood so the oxygen in the air can be uh, transferred into the blood and then uh, oxygenate the rest of the cells in the body. So when these, these viruses uh, bind to these uh, receptors in these cells, they use the cells to reproduce and they kill the cell in the process. Thus, there is a lot of debris in the lungs and also there is, um, there is no more production of surfactant. So from the pathophysiologic point of view, what happens here is that these cells inundate with debris the lung and take away the air space that is normally needed to breathe uh, and to make that exchange of oxygen from the air into the blood. And also they take away the surfactant, which is that soapy uh, type of substance that allows the lungs to be inflated. Without them is like a rubber balloon. When you inflate the rubber balloon and then you release the air, it collapses. And when it collapses, it has not enough surface to be able to transfer the oxygen from the air into the blood. So basically it produces a very bad condition in the lungs that will uh, produce what we are seeing in all the people that are seriously uh, sick. 
the mild cases, which uh, usually start with some uh, malaise and, and fever and, and cough, um, uh, and that do not progress, means that the organism was able to fight the virus and the damage was not substantial. Some people, uh, and we don't know exactly, exactly why, uh, they cannot fight these viruses in the proper way and they end up uh, allowing the virus to spread out quickly, uh, actually very, very quickly to the other, um, to the other uh, cells in the lungs and then massive destruction happens. And when this happens, there are a ton of inflammatory substances that are very aggressive and sometimes cannot differentiate between uh, our own cells and those cells that are invading uh, us or those particles that are invading us and they just produce a reaction that is very fast and very nasty for the organism. They liberate some enzymes and those enzymes produce further damage. Those are the people that we see that are getting into the hospitals and that are being uh, put in intensive care units and that need the respirators. Uh, the respirators basically help pump oxygen and air at a higher level of oxygen content and at a higher pressure, increasing the capacity of the sick lung or the uh, acutely injured lung to be able to transport this oxygen still into the blood, thus maintaining alive the person until the person recuperates. If this does not happen, then we have the problem that, um, that the, the, the persons cannot really transport the oxygen there. That's why the need for uh, enough respirators to treat these seriously ill uh, persons has become uh, very, very important in the messages throughout the world and in the messages to industry uh, in order to, to prioritize the production of these ventilators, which is pretty much the only thing that keeps uh, uh, very critical patients alive until they can recuperate on their own. So uh, the virus, as I was explaining, is a very, very uh, simple uh, particle and that uh, very simple particle uh, is composed of a single strand of RNA and, and a capsule. And you see it here in this uh, very nice uh, drawing. Uh, you can find nowadays uh, literally hundreds of these uh, uh, 3D renditions or, or drawings in the internet, and they can easily explain the very simple characteristic of these particles. Is, is just basically uh, the, the corona, which are those proteins that allows them to bind to the cells. Then there is this, uh, um, uh, this, this part of the virus that is like a capsule that protects the uh, nucleic acid. And then there is the nucleic acid, which is the, the spring-like structure that you're seeing in, in, this, um, in this life. So uh, basically, as, as they are like these, uh, they, they do nothing. However, when they bind, as I was explaining, they can introduce the RNA. With the RNA, they can produce further proteins, and uh, then they can reassemble uh, the RNA because it's replicated, and then that's what they are going to do hundreds of thousands of times in each cell until they kill the cell that is helping them uh, replicate. How did we start with this? Well, um, it's, it's basically a theoretical uh, type of, of path that has been common with the SARS initially, uh, where, where bats have been the culprits on, on this whole situation. So bats have uh, this type of viruses and they have had it uh, you know, uh, they, they have been in the identified in bats since very, very long time. Uh, some people say that in bats they have been around for hundreds of years until they produce one mutation that allows uh, that particle to be able to uh, replicate or survive in another uh, animal that is an intermediary between the bats and the humans. 
Uh, in this case, uh, we have the pangolin as the second potential culprit, and it has been linked both in the characteristics of the virus uh, doing genetic analysis and, and sequencing on, the, on these viruses, uh, because it's very alike to the one in the fats and is very alike to the uh, SARS-CoV-2 that I was talking about, that is the one that is producing the COVID-19 pandemic. And then uh, they further uh, transform themselves in a very tiny fashion to be able to produce that protein that binds to the specific cells in the humans, and that's how it started. You are all aware that it started in, in China, and it replicated fast. Why does it replicate fast? Well, because this virus has a, a characteristic, and is that because it's a, a part of, produces a respiratory disease, then it, it can be expelled every time that we cough or sneeze, or every time that we have it in the mucosas and we touch our nose uh, or our mouth and then touch a surface. Of course, that happens when a person has been infected with the virus and um, then that those viruses that are in these droplets can infect other people. Uh, other forms of, of transmission have been also uh, described. There is doubt now if, um, if, if the uh, uh, virus can be transmitted by air, meaning without the need of droplets, it can just exist as a floating particle in the air. However, the consensus so far is that this is not at least the most likely way of transmission. So because the transmission, both epidemiologically and biologically, have been proven and assured to be the most important, uh, the one that is mediated by droplets that fall into surfaces and then direct contagious uh, from people with those surfaces or those droplets, and then taking them to the mucosa of the mouth or nose, uh, it's very important that we protect ourselves against that type of transmission. Uh, what we see here is a very, very um, old, uh, probably from the 1940s, uh, uh, photograph uh, from the MIT in, in the U.S that show that every time that you cough, sneeze, or even talk, uh, these, these millions of droplets or thousands of droplets uh, invade the air that is around you and they can be uh, fired uh, into the air up to maybe around four, five, or even six feet of, of, of distance. So that's why, and that is the origin of the recommendation that you have to be a part of people uh, six feet or more in order to uh, avoid being um, infected by the coronavirus. Uh, surfaces have been linked to the uh, infection uh, with coronavirus and basically the level of survival of these particles so they are still active and can infect you in different surfaces has been different and it produces or it's, it's been reported with ranges. We don't know exactly and probably some of the conditions of the humidity in the air and the temperature in the air are also important, but they can survive from a few hours to almost a day or even more. Uh, in these cases, what, what, we, what we need is to be very thorough in the cleaning of those surfaces with uh, alcohol-based disinfectants or just soapy solutions, which have been shown to destroy this virus because of the characteristics of the capsule that involves them that is solvable by these substances. Be very careful not to start mixing and producing your own substances because you might increase the danger to yourself as some of these uh, substances, especially the ones that have chlorine, can react with other substances and produce other chemicals such as acids or even uh, very caustic um, uh, liquids. So you have to be very careful not to mix them. Uh, once this, um, this spread of the virus started in, in, in China, 
uh, it quickly went around the world. And two things have determined that, that this can happen. The first is that uh, as opposed to other diseases where the virus, virus is transmitted only uh, from people that are sick, here we can get people that are infected. And while the virus is replicating, but before it produces symptoms, so is in the pre-symptomatic uh, time, it can be transmitted to others. So people that do not know that are infected can carry this, this virus through distances and infect other people. The amount of people that can be infected with, by one person that is infected by coronavirus was estimated or has been estimated to be approximately three. So one person can infect uh, three people in average. However, we recently learned that people that are uh, declared uh, asymptomatic again after the disease, uh, uh, after they go over the clinical uh, stage of the disease, can spread the virus further for even a couple of days. So now we know that people that are released from hospitals or people that are or were infected clinically manifesting the disease, they were identified as positive for coronavirus, need to still be quarantined for more days after they feel well or normal because they can still produce uh, um, infection in others. Having said that, the amount of people that can be infected by one person with coronavirus could be then more than three. It could be four, it could be five, we still don't know. Why is this important? Just to have a comparison, influenza virus uh, infects around uh, 1.7 persons. And you know how bad uh, the, the influenza, uh, the flu, or, or the, the inf other infectious diseases that are common, like a common cold, could be when they present uh, in, in each one of the seasonal peaks that, that we know that exist. So uh, from this perspective, what you can think is that coronavirus infects more people per infected person. So you have an idea of how much this is. There is this old story of the person that took uh, the chess game for the first time to a king and, and with the 64 squares in the, in the, in the board, uh, the, the king said, this is interesting, it's a fantastic game, what do, how do I pay you? And he said, give me a grain of corn for each one of the squares, uh, duplicating the amount each square. It turns out that all the corn in the country for a whole year could not pay these men because of what we call exponential growth. So if one person infects three, then three can infect nine, nine can infect 27, and just in a few cycles that happen over just a few weeks, there could be hundreds of thousands of potential people that get infected if we do nothing. That's what is happening around the world. Uh, we know stories now from people that jump into a plane and a single person infecting many people in that plane, people that uh, were, uh, did not believe on the measures taken in, in the pandemic and or recommended by scientists and they infected many other people in public gatherings or in social gatherings. So that's why we have gotten to the next stage and the next stage is to find out how bad and how deadly is this virus. Uh, what you see here is that uh, the, the mortality rate by age. So it is, there is no doubt that uh, the older you are, the more prone to die from an infection for, by coronavirus you are. So this disease affects the lungs and the lungs get damaged or get um, compromised throughout life. We know that. Lungs are very tough organ. They, they, we have a large reserve. However, breathing air and breathing particles that are lodged into the lung, but also having a decreased capacity for immune response make all those that are older more prone to die if they would contract coronavirus. So you have seen that the recommendation of social, social isolation, which we will talk a little bit further uh, down the presentation, 
is, is very important because you do not want to infect more people first because otherwise the spread is going to be super fast. And second, you don't want to infect older people because then uh, they're going to have a very, very hard chance to survive. Uh, young people in many places were very reluctant to believe on the pandemic. And we know now of many cases of young people that even when the recommendation of social, social isolation was out, they didn't trust it, they didn't believe it, they thought that they were young and the message was it does not attack young people or if they get it, it's going to be mild. However, they infected older people in their, in their neighborhood or in, in the neighborhood, meaning uh, close to them, and those people died. Um, a, a good example of this situation was Italy. So Italy has had the highest death rate in the world and uh, th there are many theoretical uh, points of view on why this happened, but one of those is of course the distribution in the population of elder populations. So there are more older people in uh, populations in Europe uh, second is a function of how ready was the health service and we know that Europe we have a lot of the population that is distributed in small towns, especially throughout the mountain regions in the countries and they don't have good access to, uh, the, uh, to the health systems that are able to care for these severely or seriously sick or ill patients. So uh, older people will most uh, are most likely to die to the point that you see here that even it gets to the point where people over 70 or 80 years old are almost um, as prone to die as one of every 10 persons infected and 10 persons infected is an easy number to reach in these times of pandemic. So it is a deadly virus, it does not kill everybody and globally, it seems that despite the comment made by many, uh, especially if you go to the internet, that, the, that, that, that this is an exaggerated number uh, and is produced just because we cannot detect all of those that should be detected with mild cases, the results of the accumulation of the numbers has been that the death rate globally of around 2.3% uh, has not gone down even though testing is now very, very widespread. So mortality rates are associated to first, the distribution of the age of the populations, number two, the capacity of the health system to implement quick response, but number three, the capacity and the readiness of the country to implement those measures that can only be implemented by uh, governments, by administrators. So we know that there have been even presidents of nations that did not believe that this was uh, important, that thought that the virus was some even by, said by some a political uh, invention, that this was a hoax, and look where we are now more than 700,000 ca 700, cases globally, with most of the world still in the peak and in the high uh, production of cases every day. So this has not gotten even close to the end, and we need to expect that this is going to just get worse. We just need to get better at responding and following the recommendations that we all know that should be done. Uh, so this brings me to the next point, which is what do we need to do to contain uh, this type of epidemics? Uh, in, in, in the lack of uh, treatment, and, and I'm going to just make a quick point there, that now there is no treatment for the virus. There is no medication that can prevent uh, the, the infection and we do not have evidence that is of good quality and scientifically produced. We just have what we call in science anecdotal reports of one person, several persons, or a few uh, persons that have been infected, and some uh, were given some medications and they responded well, but we do not necessarily know whether it was the medication. 
However, this type of panic causes that these medications are sequestered by uh, some people that have access to them and then the people that really need the medications for other diseases where the medication is very important do not have access to these medications. And second, there is not a medication that does not produce uh, secondary effects of, or interactions that are pretty nasty. And we know that one of these medications that became very popular because it was even advertised by presidents as being the, 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 the best discovery in the world, uh, chloroquine and, and some of these derivatives or, or precursors that is, is, is now linked to deaths that are happening because people are using it uh, without uh, indication and not being formulated. So uh, having uh, put aside the topic that there is no a specific medication but that there are many trials underway that are going to give us information of whether these medications do work in whom do they work and when should they be administered, uh, we have one uh, measure to contain the pandemic and is uh, social isolation or what has become almost a catchy song tune which is flatten the curve. What you see here is that as soon as the first case presents in one disease like COVID-19, if you do not do anything, uh, if you do nothing, then a huge peak will present and that huge peak is going to uh, be devastating, is going to kill a lot of people and as soon as it's over the whole pandemic should at least theoretically be over but not without causing a tremendous amount of damage. So this damage cannot be excused by the fact that we're going to spread these throughout time and we're going to elongate the time where we have to deal with the virus. Uh, uh, the, the, the green line that you see is basically the green line that theoretically defines the capacity of health and public health system, clinical and, and public health systems to respond to this situation and accommodate uh, the handling of the sick, sick people. If you surpass the capacity of a health system, you're going to clog the health system and you're going to basically produce a catastrophe. Uh, many more people that could have survived will die just because the system is busy and clogged with uh, those that are occupying a smaller number of resources. We cannot accommodate and usually the world is never prepared for this type of pandemics from the perspective of taking care of thousands or hundreds of thousands of very sick people in high complexity systems. If we flatten the curve by, for instance, and most importantly, social isolating, so we can protect uh, those that are not infected from becoming infected and slow the spread of disease, the system can accommodate, uh, industry can produce what they would need to produce, uh, the resources are not consumed uh, quickly, the number of beds needed to to handle these Ill, uh, seriously ill people can increase. Uh, new hospitals, emergency hospitals can be created and health workers can be trained in handling these uh, seriously respiratory ill people that they are usually not trained to handle. So now everybody, even students, are being trained to try to handle these seriously ill people that make it to the hospitals and need to be hospitalized and put in critical care while they respond on their own to the virus and the viral damage and they can survive the disease. So this concept of flattening the curve has many positive effects. It does, however, have one effect that we would not like to see and is that it amplifies the amount of time that we will have to deal with this disease throughout. So uh, what you have heard of governments that say, I will compromise to take my people, put them in, in, in the house and, and, and shut down a lot of the public uh, and social gathering places for two weeks is just a, 
an approximation that was done based on the biology of the virus and the what we call the clinical course of the disease, which typically spans two to three weeks. However, if we are expanding the response and the appearance of this pandemic and slowing the time where the peak of the most number of patients is going to happen, what we are doing is spreading the issue over time. So basically what I am just trying to say is be very patient because this is not going to be over in two weeks. It's not going to be over in four weeks. We really do not know when this is going to be over. When is socially isolation going to stop? Uh, very difficult to say. Uh, you see what is happening in China. They say it's over, let's stop. And now we have evidence that a second wave is, is beginning to peak again, uh, just because people started to go out. So we need to be prepared. We need to be patient. We need to just uh, uh, collaborate with the overall health system and with the authorities that are trying to do things well uh, by containing and flattening this curve so they can accommodate the resources where they are needed. And yes, there will be economical consequences. And uh, at CDC, I remember that we used to call that every time a, a, a world uh, crisis or disaster occurs, there are really, really bad things that happen acutely, but there are secondary gains out of these catastrophes that we need to start appreciating. So uh, time with your families, uh, cleaning the world, etc., etc., are some things that you see that are also happening. However, let's don't distract ourselves from the matter of hand, which is we need to continue doing what we are doing to control this pandemic. So what do we need to do now? What we need to do is, in essence, four things. The first thing is we need to avoid the entrance of the virus to new places. So, so those places that are not just yet infected, we need to protect them. We'll need, we, we cannot go there. Uh, all the measures that have been taken although they were deemed as exaggerated at the, at the beginning, have produced a very different response in different countries. And now we have cases all throughout the world that have told the rest of the world what needs to be done. Uh, UAE has been one of the countries deemed the safest place to be in the world because it responded quickly, it responded accurately, it responded based on scientific evidence, and it did the right thing. Other places, Spain, they said this is not important, this is not uh, an emergency, this is, uh, is happening elsewhere, it will never reach us, and look what is going on. Italy, uh, Spain, and now the US having the largest number of cases, and when you correct by population, also having the highest number of deaths among this, their populations. The U.S. plays with great resources, delayed the response, and now we're facing the country with the highest number of cases in the global. So you can consult of these resources and you can know exactly what to do. Uh, following sites in the internet that know uh, what to do and uh, are basing the recommendations in the outmost current knowledge of the disease and the spread and the behavior of the disease. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention site, Karolinska Institute, Khalifa University, Ministries of Health are good sites to consult. Be very careful with those YouTube videos that recommend you to even put a uh, hair dryer in your mouth to heat and kill the virus. I mean, this is nonsense. Uh, it's, 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 very, it's, very, um, it's very absurd that even physicians are recommending such measures. Maybe it's because they put the blow dryer in their mouth and they filled up their brain with air, or hot air or something like that. I don't understand. So don't follow those recommendations. Follow the recommendations that are given by these trustable sites. 
Slow the spread of disease is the second thing that you must do and we all must collaborate to do. Uh, I already talked about social isolation is the most important measure. It's not really a quarantine. Quarantine is for sick people, people that have been proven to be infected. This is protecting everybody that has not been infected from becoming infected. We need to increase awareness and preparedness. I cannot imagine how it would have been to handle this uh, pandemic without the availability of internet and communications. We are all grateful we have been able to keep teaching our students. We have been able to be up to date in the news. We, we just need to be sensible to filter the information. Access to the information is not a problem of this century. It is filtering which information is truthful and which information is misleading information. So I, at the end, I will try to make some recommendations of what we know, what should we do, and we should not do in these circumstances. And uh, we need to last and, but not least, understand the situation in real time and respond in a timely fashion. As I explained to you, uh, now we have examples of full countries that did not uh, respond in time and now they are having the worst time of all and having the highest death rates of all uh, between, between, uh, globally between all the countries that have been affected, which is pretty much the whole world. Uh, what you must not do in these circumstances? So, so you, you, you do not self-prescribe. You, you, you cannot follow a logic uh, that has not been proven. Just wait. There are enough number of cases to draw scientific conclusions that are based on evidence very quickly. And we are doing that and there are many, many trials and groups analyzing information that are now ongoing and there is a lot of resources that governments and institutions have been spending in supporting true scientific research to produce scientifically sound guidance and recommendations that are evidence-based on how to do things. For now, do not self-prescribe and do not take any medication with the hope that is going to either avoid infection or decrease the amount and the seriousness and the severity of the infection. Do not use hair dryers or any other mean to try to heat your mucosas and your mouth and the air that you breathe because you might produce burns and, you, and, and it's not going to do anything. So, uh, so the, the senseless use of these type of recommendations uh, really blows my mind and unfortunately some people that are very nervous and some people that react to this information will try anything or most of the things that are being said uh, from uh, doing nasal washes with a solution of lemon and vinegar and salt. Uh, I, I mean that should be done consistently to those that recommend it because it's pretty painful and pretty uncomfortable and it doesn't do anything. The virus needs, can be killed with high temperatures, but now the evidence says that it could need up to 70 degrees centigrade to actually die. So these are temperatures that are very dangerous. You will never reach these temperatures with a hair dryer or with a steam bath before you burn yourself with these, with these, uh, with these measures. Uh, there, there is not such a thing as a miraculous cure. With this number of cases, if anything would work, we would know immediately. So probably some things are going to produce small differences that multiply, but the millions of people that are being affected or will be affected most likely pretty soon uh, will produce a difference. However, we do not know what those things are. What we need to know now is that you must protect yourself from being infected and if you are infected, you must protect others from becoming infected. And as I said before, many, many trials are testing medications, uh, including chloroquine, 
for the, for the sake of understanding if it really works, if it's really worth the effort, and in which cases, because it's pretty rare that one medication works for all, everywhere, in all the cases. We know that that's not uh, really what happens. So we need to work in unison with the health system. Health system is really overwhelmed. And if it's not overwhelmed, is now overwhelmed with preparedness, trying to be prepared for a potential peak that might present everywhere. Even if we try our best, we do not have control over the behavior of the virus and the behavior of the environment that surround these viruses. We know that socially isolation works, that it flattens the curve and it allows us more time to respond, making adequate uh, recommendations, solutions and interventions in order to get to the best place that, they, that we can get. Uh, we cannot overwhelm the health system. We cannot just be insensitive and be senseless and be responsible and then uh, promote social gatherings uh, because this will get more people infected and will get more people into the critical phases of the disease and even will get more people dead. So remain where you are, remain with your people, do not interact with others unless it's absolutely necessary. If you do so, please follow the recommendations of uh, disinfecting yourself surfaces and elements that have been in contact with others and then again use a lot of common sense to use the information that is scientifically sound. There is not something that vibrates in the air that is going to destroy these viruses. There is not uh, overheating yourself, there is no medications, there is nothing of these that works so for now, what we know is we need to remain put, we need to remain patient, we need to remain where we are, doing the best thing that we can do for ourselves and for others. So in the pandemic, my last recommendations on these presentations is all the Bs that you need to do. You need to be safe, you need to be sensitive, you need to be patient, you need to be informed, you need to be prudent, you need to be nice, very nice to yourself and be nice to others. And be productive. There is time to do a lot of things that you really, really thought that you would never be able to do because you were too busy with life. Now life and the world is giving you a chance to do some of those things. So take advantage of this time. Don't forget that there are others out there in the same circumstances. Try to work on doing everything that you can for others, but remotely. That's why we keep teaching our students. That's why we will keep on adjusting to these virtual environments and to the best use of these virtual tools that now we fortunately have to make uh, this time, elongated time, produced by flattening the curve, the most productive that they can be. But most importantly, be safe, do not get infected, protect others if you are infected, and just take care. So I think that I will end here. I uh, hope that I have provided you with uh, some key points and some guidance. Uh, my recommendation is then again, gather information and try to use it in the best way while remaining inside at home uh, and out of uh, the contact with, with people unless it's strictly necessary. Now I think that we will have a few minutes to entertain a few questions if you have and maybe I can help answer some of them. Thank you very much in the name of Khalifa University, the College of Medicine at Khalifa University and the Department of Epidemiology of, and Public Health.
Okay, I, I have a few questions here. Uh, the first question is, uh, what is my estimate on when the virus will peak in the UAE? Uh, it's, it's very hard to say. Uh, the peak is determined by how the, the, the virus behaves in the population and how the populations behave with the virus. So what we hope is that we're going to have a very, very low peak that is not going to affect or overwhelm health services and that it will start to slowly go down. Uh, but predicting when the peak is going to happen is difficult to impossible anywhere. So we don't know anywhere in the world when the peak is going to happen, and that is one of the problems. People do, know, do not know how much to prepare in order to, to, to predict the, the number of patients of critically ill people that they will have, uh, the number of tests that they will need, how many tests can be done in the healthy population so we can predict communication and infection uh, patterns, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, second question, is there any way to make a substance to block the virus binding to the receptors? I guess that the theoretical, question, the theoretical answer would be yes, uh, probably. Uh, however, uh, we, we just don't know. Uh, there are many diseases for which we thought that it would be relatively straightforward to produce a vaccine, for instance. We have not been able to do so. There are many diseases and many infectious diseases for which we thought that we produce uh, uh, an antibiotic that would cure everybody, and we have not been able to do so. So in theory, the answer would be yes. Whether we're going to make it there, uh, is, is hard to say. We certainly have the capacity in our labs right now to be able to do this. Industry has the capacity to produce these new molecules. The problem is whether there will be enough resources and enough interest to continue researching uh, specifically on this virus, because then again, viruses mutate and they become different. And as they become different, they start behaving different. Uh, is it true that COVID-19 is less spread in Sudan, Mauritania, and Sub-Saharan line due to malaria immunity? Uh, we, we don't know. The answer to these questions is we don't know. We know that the behavior of the virus and the, the usual climate that is more proper uh, was, was, was theoretically better in the northern hemisphere at least in the months where, where the virus appeared, December, January, February, uh, we, we still do not know what is going to happen in the South. And actually, one of the biggest concerns now is when uh, the spread of the virus will happen in, in some of the southern countries or the southern hemisphere countries. So uh, malaria immunity as a cross immunity with the virus, I personally don't think so. I am not an expert virologist or parasitologist, uh, microbiologist, but, but I, I do not think that, that uh, one has a relationship with the other. Will there be a recording to watch later? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. So please, uh, stay tuned, you will probably get some link or uh, something like that where, where, where is, is going or, or is going to be posted soon. Can I please summarize uh, the situation in U uh, uh, UAE? The, the situation in UAE, as I mentioned during my presentation, is actually quite good. We, we had very, very responsive authorities and the government was very responsive doing the right thing from the very beginning at the right moment with the right people in the right time. So when this combination of events happen and you have enough resources, the situation is good. The number of cases is relatively small, one of the lowest in the whole world. Uh, the rate of growth is one of the slowest ones, so we are doing things fine and well by isolating ourselves, uh, even though 
uh, I, I've heard many comments that, that this is unfair, that this is not good for the economy. Yes, those things are all obvious. However, the alternative is really, really bad, which is to have a peak that is going to overwhelm the resources of the country. Then we will see a lot of deaths. And picture that we do not know what the future is with this virus. We have no idea if we will ever have a vaccine that is going to work well. We do not know whether the virus is going to mutate to a form where all the measures that we have now and the immunity that people are hopefully developing uh, after a disease, mild disease, will, uh, will happen. So, so it's, it's very hard to tell what the future is, is going to be. For now, uh, the situation here is one of the best in the world. Another question is, um, oh, I answer already this one. Is there a vaccine in trial? Well, actually there are many, many people, multiple uh, people working independently and together. And one of the striking things, and I am going to make this parenthesis because I didn't mention it, of this pandemic has been the incredible amount of collaboration and collaborative, collaborative spirit that has been developed globally. Usually these circumstances trigger uh, the selfishness, selfishness in, in some, um, some, some organizations to produce the vaccine that is going to make them very wealthy. Right now, that has been put aside and every many people are working collaboratively to learn from each other and their research in order to produce the vaccine as fast as, fast as possible. However, the experts estimate that the vaccine is not, uh, is not going to be developed anytime close. And once it is developed and it, it, it's, it's surely that it works for the virus, we need to make sure that it's safe in humans and that we are not going to produce more harm than, than the disease itself. How the virus has been developed or initiated in the bats in the first place? Biologically, is there any reason behind the existence of viruses? Uh, people say, some, some, some experts, and of course virologists who like viruses a lot, say that, that we are hosts on a virus world. People say that if we would put all the viruses together, the mass of those viruses would be bigger, greater than the mass of the whole uh, human uh, being and uh, all the life uh, beings put together. So, so they say that we live in a viral world. Uh, we just don't see them. And they usually do not, do not become uh, harmful. However, with one, when one virus becomes, as, as this one, harmful for a specific cell of a specific um, a person or, or animal, then it becomes a problem. So uh, it, it is estimated that some of the other nasty coronaviruses that, that jump from bats to either cats or camels or pangolins and then uh, infected the humans were around for hundreds of years before they were able to produce that change in their constitution that allowed them to synthesize or have this protein that then allows them to bind to these specific cells. So it's, it's a very random uh, situation to occur. So, so uh, I don't know if, if, uh, if there is an answer for uh, uh, a reason for existence for viruses. The fact is that they are here to stay. They will not go away. And, and we need to learn how to deal with them. One of the big lessons to be lear learned about this pandemic is that we were not prepared. The health system was not prepared. The researchers were not prepared, the institutions were not prepared, the governments were not prepared. Now we know that it can happen. And it's not now on whether this will happen again or not, it's when it is going to happen again. 
So we have had smaller examples with SARS and MERS and H1, uh, H1N1, etc., etc. Uh, but this was this has been the worst. Will we have another one like this? Yes, we will. How do we prepare? Well, we now know how we responded to this one. It is going to be a matter of analyzing all the information altogether, analyzing our resources, doing, doing a needs assessment, and, and work on a strategic plan on how can we build an infrastructure that can respond quickly and swiftly to any uh, uh, to, to, to these circumstances initially. We know that there has been an issue of whether uh, actions were delayed at the beginning and the answer is yes, they were delayed and probably uh, people not telling or not being transparent about being infected and transmitting it to others irresponsibly it has happened throughout the globe. Uh, so, yes, we need preparedness and this will happen again. We don't know when. And how long does this pandemic will last? Nobody really knows. What we know is that we live on the virus timeline. So any promises in the future might be relevant. We can only plan for a close time from now. We do not know, we can control a few days, maybe even a few weeks, and we need to start preparing for the effects of this, uh, of, of this uh, pandemic. We need to be really, really into spreading uh, the news, the accurate information, so the disease does not spread, spread further and, and controlling it and preparing for uh, the next uh, steps in the pandemic. Thank you very much.